It's now my distinct honor to introduce a public health leader who is having an incredible impact in Los Angeles and beyond, the 2019 Lester Breslow Distinguished Lecturer, Dr. Barbara Ferrer. Uh, good evening, and uh, thank you so much, Dean, uh, for the wonderful opportunity to be here. I'm so honored and also want to um, thank Deborah uh, for allowing me to, to uh, be part of this legacy work. Uh, it's always wonderful when you get to meet a family member of somebody who uh, you've held in such high esteem for you know, most of my career. Uh, and you know, that's really where Dr. Breslow sits for so many of us who are you know, in the older generation of, of public health practitioners, you know, he was a champion for the notion that what we're really about is health. Uh, it's not about health care. Um, and health care is an important component, but I really think he paved the way for understanding, you know, our work is to ensure that everyone has access to optimal health and well-being. So, you know, I want to thank you for the honor of being here. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge and thank uh, Dr. Carlisle. You know, he was the honoree last year, and I think the world of uh, him and uh, all of the folks at CDU as well for, you know, joining in this amazing place uh, of LA County uh, that's really putting front and center, I think, some of the new practices for public health as we move into uh, the next decade. Um, so, you know, really honored to be here uh, with all of you as well. Uh, James, Lamar, and Yelba, you know, it's so exciting to see sort of our next generation of public health leaders, you know, who are champion issues around health justice. Um, because that is the work, I think, that paves the way for us to create uh, the kind of world we want to see uh, and the kind of world we want to also contribute to and be in service of. Um, um, I uh, obviously owe a debt of gratitude uh, to Jonathan. I, I actually wouldn't even be here today uh, without his support, uh, not just as sort of a mentor for many, many years, but also in making it possible for me to consider being part of the Great County family. And I want to acknowledge that I'm joined here by Dr. Davis, our wonderful county health officer, and Lauren Dunning, our board liaison, uh, you know, part of the wonderful county family that supports the work we're doing. Um, I am going to take a, a little bit of time today uh, to talk about, you know, really three sort of themes uh, that I want to weave together. You know, I want to start with really, you know, what does LA County look like? Uh, and then what do we know about health equities? And I want to really talk a little bit about two examples. Uh, issues related to infant mortality and is issues related to exposures, differential exposures to environmental hazards. And then I'm hoping I close with uh, an introduction of a possible framework for us to move work forward. Um, so, you know, LA County, we're big. You know, those of you who live here know and have lived here for a long time know we're about 4,000 square miles. We have about 10,000, 10 million residents. Uh, we're made up of uh, 88 cities. These are what we call incorporated and another 104 unincorporated areas. Um, and one out of every four people from California actually lives in our county. We're also predominantly a county of people of color. Uh, almost 50% of the folks who live here are Latinos. And, uh, and then uh, you know our white residents make up only about a quarter of the folks here. So this is sort of the land uh, where diversity becomes our strength, uh, where our cultural uh, and linguistic intersections actually are woven into the fabric of everything we do and how we see ourselves. Um, and um, it, has, uh, it has, though, however, its implications for health status. So when I first came here and I was looking at the data, You'll notice LA County, our life expectancy here is actually higher than the national average by about three years. Uh, the problem is that it uh, is hiding some stark uh, disparities or inequities, uh, where we literally have um, some folks living 10 years more than uh, black or African American residents uh, in this county. Um, and you can also see life expectancy not only varies by race, 
and ethnicity, but also by where you're living. And uh, again, a pretty, a pretty uh, in, implicit connection there between where you live and your race and ethnicity. Uh, those folks that are living in our poorer communities and our communities of color live on average as much as 10 years less than those folks that are living in what I call some of our beach communities and some communities right around this campus. Um, and it starts at birth, where black babies in LA County are somewhere between three and four times more likely to die in the first year of life. Uh, and you'll also see this at the end of life when our black residents are significantly more likely to die uh, at an earlier age than others and at a higher rate of mortality. Um, it, this is pretty much the picture for African Americans, black residents, uh, in LA County for just about every measure of uh, health that we routinely collect in terms of both mortality and morbidity, with the exception of COPD, I've put some measures up here, and you can see that the picture is one of stark, inequitable outcomes in terms of people's health status. So I'm gonna give you all a sort of a couple of minutes to just either turn to the person next to you, or if you're not a person who wants to socialize, just sit and think yourself. But I'd like everyone to just spend a minute and say, you know, I see this, I've either learned about it or I understand it from my lived experience. What do I think explains it? Um, so I want everyone, you know, feel free, love for you to share. If you're not in the mood to share, think on your own. But, you know, just we're just gonna do this for about a minute. Um, so that people can sort of think what accounts for this level of inequity. I, I know there's a lot of wisdom in this room, and I'm sure as I go through my presentation, there are definitely parts of it that are gonna resonate with your conversations. And if you had had more time, you might have actually talked about um, just about everything I'm gonna mention, but I'm gonna try to organize it in a way that allows us um, to be very deliberate about developing our understanding of what are the factors that we think contribute to the inequity so that we can be very deliberate about the practices uh, and policies we put in place to address the inequitable distribution of poor health. Um, one thing I wanted to just start with is this notion that um, although healthcare is a really important component of our well-being, 50% of our well-being is not tied to the healthcare system at all. It's actually tied to environmental, social conditions, the context and the constructs that uh, hold together our communities, and to what I call the built environment. Um, and you know, just about everybody here, I think, has a really deep understanding of what we now call the social determinants of health and the important role. Uh, that these factors play uh, in helping uh, us understand what people need in order to be healthy, in order to live their lives to their fullest ability. And many of the things that are on this list I know are not new to folks. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about economic stability, about the importance of education, uh, health and healthcare still very important to all of us. Uh, what we have in our neighborhood. This isn't just our exposures to what we traditionally call environmental hazards, but what's our exposure to tobacco advertising? What's our exposure to the sale of alcohol and now cannabis in our neighborhoods? And then, you know, the social uh, sort of constructs. Uh, social cohesion is a term you often hear people talk about. Um, civic engagement. How much are we encouraged, allowed to work together, join together uh, to really create those communities uh, where uh, we and our families will thrive? You'll see I've put in issues around incarceration because there are forces that both promote social cohesion and then there are forces that actually work against social cohesion. Um, and I wanted to tie this together. Oh, let me just go back for a sec. Um, and I wanted to note that, you know, for us at the, at the public health department, uh, we're very focused on the work and the world of understanding social determinants of health, but we've also done this uh, understanding the context of racism and discrimination and really calling those out not as one of uh, a variable that we need to pay attention to, 
under one of our columns here, but rather as an overarching theme and force that really helps determine our ability to access the resources that we need uh, for optimal health and well-being. Racism has an independent impact on our health and well-being, which we'll talk about in a minute, but it also has an impact on our ability to really uh, live uh, with economic stability. Uh, there's rampant discrimination in the workplace. Uh, there's discrimination in how uh, and what resources are available to promote good educational systems. Our, the way we fund education is in and of, of itself you know, a system that actually penalizes those folks with the least amount of resources from having good schools in their neighborhoods. And we could go on and on and talk for a long time about why we claim that for pretty much every social determinant that you see in the column, you can talk about an independent impact that racism will actually have uh, on your ability to actually have the kinds of resources that we know are so important for health and well-being. Um, and I wanted to say um, the reason it's so important for us to think about this is that study after study after study uh, now shows the real connection between the access to those resources and health and well-being. So for example, the Department of Public Health did a study in 2016 around parks. And what it noted in the study was two very important uh, factors for LA County. One is that the distribution of parks uh, and green space uh, was very different. And then in fact, black and Latino uh, residents had much less access to parks and green space than other residents in LA County. And then it also went on and noted that the higher rates of obesity and uh, chronic illness that are experienced by black and brown residents in LA County can in fact be tied directly to a disinvestment in parks and green space in their communities. Um, and it's this kind of sort of tying together the dots that becomes, I think, critically important for our work. Um, and then also allows us to really understand why we talk about health equity and not equality. Um, I think this is a, a great illustration. It, it's not mine, <laughs> uh, but we like to use it. Um, you know, equality is when you give everybody the same uh, because you know it will be helpful. So we had a problem people needed to be able to get around, and we went and bought 100 bikes, and they're all exactly the same bike, and then we distributed them, and lo and behold, uh, it's not, in fact, helpful uh, to everybody. Uh, some people couldn't use that bike at all, and other people were really struggling uh, with that resource. When equity really means that you really figure out what it is that people need in order for them to have those kinds of opportunities and resources that lead to optimal health and well-being, and it acknowledges it's not a level playing field. Um, and that, in fact, if you're going to do work around equity, you're going to understand deeply uh, that we have disinvested in so many ways um, in our communities, uh, disproportionately in those communities that are black, Latino, Asian, uh, and uh, continue to sort of uh, look at patterns of othering folks when we think about what that distribution of resources should look like, um, which means that uh, for our work, we'd have to actually acknowledge the disinvestments and the discrimination and then figure out what were the resources and opportunities everyone would need for optimal health and well-being. And I want to use a couple of examples to illustrate um, not only uh, what I think may help account for and explain some of the inequities, but also try to identify pathway forward. Um, because again, this work is going to be difficult and complicated, um, and it's not necessarily um, easy to think about how to work on issues that are complicated and complex. And I want to start with infant mortality, because we talked a minute ago about sort of the stark differences uh, in infant mortality rates here in LA County. Um, and I want to note that um, this has been historic, so if you, you can go back 25, 30 years and you'll continue to see this very wide gap. As a matter of fact, the rate of infant, black infant deaths in LA County today 
uh, is higher than it was for white babies uh, 25 years ago. Um, and that it's primarily due to the inequities that we see in uh, preterm and low birth weight uh, babies. So black babies are much more likely to be born early and at a low birth weight uh, than all other babies. And being born very early and at a very low birth weight puts you at much greater risk for both poor health outcomes but also for uh, dying in your first year of life. Um, and one thing that folks do is when we think about this, um, there are some folks who might say, well, you know, maybe this is just genetics. Um, and some folks have even actually talked about a black gene. We know that's not factually possible. Um, but we also can just look at the fact that here in LA County, if you're actually US born, you have a much greater chance of having a poor birth outcome than if you're uh, born in Africa or in the Caribbean, the two countries where most other black Africans come from uh, who are in LA County and give birth. Uh, foreign born African, uh, Amer Africans actually have better birth outcomes in LA County than African Americans. Um, and it's not uh, really necessarily uh, associated uh, with education. Education is important. You can see here that obviously having more education offers some protection, but what it doesn't do is explain the gap. So black women who are highly educated actually have worse birth outcomes than white women who haven't even graduated from high school. And this isn't data just for LA County. This is actually data across uh, the country. Um, and uh, we don't have a good measure here in LA County for income, but if we used insurance as a proxy, by looking at folks who were insured uh, publicly versus folks who are insured privately, uh, we would still see that black women who had private insurance, which really stands usually for uh, being in the workforce and having an income, uh, did worse than white women who were receiving public insurance, which usually means they're at much lower income levels uh, than those who are getting private insurance. It's an imperfect measure. Uh, but if you look at data across the country where we actually use markers for income, you will see the same gradient. Um, and it's also not necessarily about how uh, black women are behaving. Um, black women who enter into prenatal care early and stay in prenatal care consistently still are one and a half times more likely than white women who don't get into prenatal care at all or get in very late in their third trimester to have birth outcomes. Um, and smoking. Smoking highly correlated with poor birth outcomes, but black women who don't smoke at all have worse outcomes than white women who smoke uh, during their, smoke every day during their pregnancy. It's also interesting to note that if you are a black woman and you do smoke, your risk is much higher than if you're a white woman who smokes. Um, and uh, again, um, there is something going on uh, that we need to understand that's beyond what our usual um, ideas are about what are the factors that contribute. Um, it's not like these aren't important. It's not like it's not important to get into prenatal care early or not smoke, uh, take care of yourself, stay connected to services, uh, be able to get a good education, but it doesn't explain the gap. Um, and research, starting actually with Dr. Michael Liu, who is from UCLA, did his first research here about 20 years ago. Um, folks have been actually looking at what is the explanation. Um, and it turns out that um, there's a, a lot of evidence that indicates that um, chronic, what we call toxic stress, um, can in fact contribute to very poor health, health outcomes, particularly around birth outcomes. And that you could think about racism as a chronic stressor. Um, and if you thought about racism as a chronic stressor, it may help you understand sort of the toxic impact it has on childbirth. Um, so, uh, you know, you think about uh, our bodies are really well primed to handle stress. If we saw a lion run across the room, our bodies would immediately uh, have a biological response that would allow us to run much faster than we normally run. 
Um, we would shut down certain, uh, certain, certain functions would actually shut down and other functions would really increase. One thing that would happen is cortisol would really increase. Um, and that's good because we ran fast and we got away from the lion. The problem is when uh, the lion is chasing you every day. When you have stress every single day, it actually turns out you don't ever return to a normal level of, uh, in this case, a hormonal response. Um, and in fact, what happens is you're now not stressed, you're stressed out. And being stressed out, I'm just, you know, simply so that, you know, because we're not gonna have a lot of time, being stressed out actually wears down body parts. Um, and it's that wearing down of body parts that now there's ample evidence contributes um, to uh, inequities that we see uh, in our health outcomes. And that, in fact, for, uh, for people of color, particularly for black people in this country, this is intergenerational at this point as well. Um, and so it, it's not just the onslaught you're facing, it's actually the historical legacy of the onslaughts that generations of folks have faced as well. Um, so we do have a community action plan uh, for trying to address the complexities that we think uh, contribute to this inequity in birth outcomes. And we've pledged in five years to actually reduce this gap by 30%. Um, and we're focused uh, in a whole host of areas that I think traditionally public health departments have not organized their work uh, to attend to. Um, and uh, we've done this by really understanding that this inequity in birth outcomes is not an individual failing. Uh, it's actually uh, a social problem. Um, and uh, for people of color, for women, particularly black women, they have spent a lifetime thinking that they have done something wrong that's resulted uh, in their baby being born early or their baby dying in that first year of life because we have actually uh, and reinforce that message by focusing on individual actions that people ought to be taking uh, to promote a healthy birth. Uh, when in fact, in this case, those individual actions in and of themselves would not be sufficient. Um, and you may need to actually focus your work in some other areas, and you know, here we sort of spell it out about reducing this exposure to stress. Um, so our strategy, which you know, was developed uh, thanks in large part to uh, many black women who have spent hours sort of guiding this work over many, many decades at this point, um, but also sort of working and teaching our staff about how would we think about making a difference. Uh, and you can see here, reduce the sources of stress, uh, block the pathways that turn social stress to physiological stress and intervene early. Um, and so there's a entirely different approach uh, for us at the health department to organizing our work and working with others to organize work at the community level um, that would actually help mitigate the factors that we think contribute to uh, a poor birth outcome. Um, and I don't wanna say we're, we're still, we still think women need to be connected to care. We think women have to have good care. We think uh, we need support, women need to be healthy. Um, but our ways of approaching this are to really also understand that there is a lot of policy work that needs to happen as well. Uh, and that we would be falling short if we didn't figure out as public health practitioners how we engage with others to promote the kinds of policies that actually support health and well-being for women. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm gonna switch um, and, and give another example around exposures to harmful uh, hazards, environmental hazards, um, because I, I want to try to connect sort of the dots between thinking about how do we mitigate around uh, toxic stress for individuals to thinking about how do we mitigate around toxic stress in communities? Um, so, you know, many of you here have probably looked at what we call the Cal Enviro scan, which really is a composite look at where communities 
have both the highest rates of pollution and the highest rates of poor health outcomes. Um, and for those of you who know LA, you can see that uh, this is certainly disproportionate, this, this um, poor sort of uh, poor health outcomes associated with a high burden of pollution is really concentrated in a handful of communities. For those of you who know LA, you know we're looking at a lot of South LA and some of East LA and a little bit up in Antelope Valley. Um, and uh, when we think about environmental issues uh, in LA County, one thing we have to acknowledge is we have a lot of heavy industry located very close to what we call um, uh, you know, uh, sensitive use areas. Sensitive use areas is where people live, where people go to school, where people go for recreation. Um, and you know, there's lots of issues with having heavy industry located close to where people are living uh, and uh, going to school. Uh, air pollution, noise and vibration, and that's noise from you know, like the port where you have all those heavy diesel trucks coming in and out, unloading goods and bringing in goods, um, to noise and vibration from oil wells. 4,000 active oil wells uh, in, the, in the county of LA. Uh, some of those are, are literally located in the backyards of where people are living. And the noise and vibration from that well, obviously, is a source of what we would call an environmental hazard. Uh, we have soil contamination, and we have contaminated runoff, um, which is oftentimes from all the pollutants, both in the air and on the streets, that then get into our water supply and actually contaminate uh, our ability to sort of reclaim that water and use it um, for other you know, uh, needs that we have uh, in our in our communities. Um, you know, the health impacts are well known, uh, particularly from pollution. Uh, pulmonary functions are reduced. Cardiovascular disease is associated with pollution, cancer risks, and brain growth and development. Uh, as a matter of fact, in LA County, again, disproportionality. Uh, you can see this in a whole bunch of rates. I'm going to pull up the rate for asthma. Black children are much more likely than all other children to have very high rates of asthma. And if you look at sort of what's going on in South LA uh, and in Antelope Valley, you can actually, once you start going down to the neighborhood level, you can see that there's really excessive exposures in those neighborhoods uh, to pollutants. Um, I want to talk about one example uh, about lead poisoning. Um, this was Exide, the Exide battery recycling plant. Uh, this is in East LA. Uh, it was running without the right permits for decades. Uh, the state failed to issue the right permits. It was actually spewing um, all kinds of environmental hazards, particularly arsenic and lead, for 38 years into a community. It's predominantly low-income Latino community, lots of renters, and lots of in-and-out migration into the neighborhoods. Um, there's actually 10,000 parcels, 20,000 houses uh, in the neighborhood that was affected. Uh, and the impact of this was that, in fact, um, every single parcel in a 1.7-mile radius had elevated levels of lead in the soil. Now, this impact was measured years ago. Uh, three years ago, uh, folks knew how polluted um, the area was. Um, and I want to say that today, out of the 20,000 homes, 10,000 parcels that need to be cleaned up, uh, less than 300 have been cleaned, even though the legislature two years ago allocated $196 million for the cleanup. Um, these are the same communities that score very low on all of the composite um, uh, indicators that we have around exposure to environmental hazards. So it's not just that these are communities have high exposure to lead, they also have high exposure to a whole bunch of other stuff. They're in the third and sixth percentile uh, when you rank them compared to other communities across the county. Um, and so what I want to point out here is this is what I call an example of what I call community stress. Um, we could think about individual stress and our jobs as public health practitioners to acknowledge individual stress, 
but we also need to think about community stress. Um, and I really think that the manifest manifestations of community stress are important for us to recognize. And I want to talk to, to about two in particular, because I'm running out of time. I want to talk about uh, systemic uh, fraudulence. Um, so when the state is allocated money, uh, almost three years ago to clean up in a community uh, that has high levels of lead at everybody's property. And those, there are children who live there, there are pregnant women who live there. Uh, that lead is tracked in and out of houses every day. Uh, when you have $196 million and you don't expedite a cleanup, that's what I would call systemic fraudulence. Uh, when you have weak social networks uh, because you actually tell false narratives that shut down the voices of folks in the community around the exposures, uh, you have a big problem. Uh, and we actually uh, have come up with strategies for acknowledging the importance of really focusing on the fact that um, there are all kinds of factors that contribute to the disproportionality of environmental hazards. And if all we did is stay in our usual box, which is emissions reduction, uh, we would actually not be successful in remediating uh, exposures that happen in communities like the communities surrounded by the battery plant, the Exide battery plant. That we, in fact, are going to have to work in three other boxes um, in order for our actions to be effective. And primarily, we need to pay attention to the community empowerment box. Because as, as a regulatory agency, my powers are very limited. The state actually has a lot more control than locals do around environmental hazards. And without the empowerment, the, the strategic ability to allow people who have these experiences to not only lift up their voices, but come up with the solutions, uh, we're going to actually face many more Exide-like uh, experiences in LA County. Uh, when the resident, we did a survey, we, we door knocked on all 20,000 homes. Uh, we had uh, lots of people doing this with us. And one day we reached 17,000 homes. Uh, we collected as part of that information from the residents, gave that information back to the community groups working in those communities, and they produced a report. And they made recommendations on how we actually needed to address the problems they were facing. Um, this is way more helpful than having a health department decide what needs to get done in a community like Exide, where in fact we almost become part of the problem instead of part of the solution. Um, and so, you know, again, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flip to the end. I see you. I see you're going to hold up. I just want to talk about sort of how does this tie together then for what we ought to be doing. Um, and what we really need to think about, and th this is um, Dr. Frieden's uh, pyramid from CDC when he, was, uh, when he was the director there. We really need to do our work at the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, we're really good at working at the top of the pyramid, but the most impact we're going to have is if we can actually do a lot of work at the bottom. Um, and here at the, at the health department, one of the ways we're organizing our work to do it differently is to really um, focus on work around uh, inequities. Um, and uh, one of uh, our, our uh, sort of signature effort here is to actually publicly state some measurable metrics that people can judge our work by in five years about how we're actually eliminating or narrowing gaps. Um, but you can go to our website and, and look up more information about the center and our plan. What I think is important is that we have some different constructs for ourselves uh, at the health department. Uh, and accountability, integrity are at the heart of it, and that means a lot of transparency. Uh, people ought to know how we spend every dollar we get. We have a $1.3 billion budget. We ought to be able to make a difference. Uh, and people ought to know how that money gets distributed. Uh, I also want to say that we have to do uh, work with the resources we have now and do that work differently uh, in two very important areas I want to sort of shout out. One is how we use data. Uh, we can't continue to produce reports that tell everyone that black residents do worse than white residents because what has happened with our reports is that that has really just perpetuated the false narrative that for some reasons 
black people are behaving in ways uh, that are actually accounting for uh, those health differences. So data reports that don't connect the dots, that don't actually show what are the conditions that lead to the inequities are actually more harmful than they are helpful. Um, so for those of us who are working in public health, we need to sort of switch how we're using our information. Uh, we also need to understand how important it is uh, for us to help lift up the voices of people who have lived experiences and have those voices not only be able to help us with the actual authentic narrative, but also lead the way to the solutions that are actually going to make a difference. Uh, we need to put our resources back into communities uh, as communities are getting organized to build the kinds of structures and practices and policies that they know make sense for health in their communities. Um, and so I'm going to just close with you know, a reframing. Um, I, I think we always ask some really good questions in public health. Uh, but uh, some of those are conventional questions. Uh, and they're, they're still worth asking. We're still a service-oriented organization uh, and we'll continue to do so. But I think we need to couple that with asking what I call the health equity questions, which are really questions about how is power distributed, how are resources distributed, what's an organizing strategy uh, for uh, redistributing those, those opportunities and resources that we know contribute to optimal health and well-being. I'm done. <laughs> right on time. So thank you very much. And I, I think there's time for questions. Right? Thank you very much. Thank you. OK. Um, we have time for a few questions. And I'll step down. I'm going to step down so I'm out of the light a little bit. So please ask some questions or comments. Comments are welcome as well. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Hi. Um, my name is Rebecca Israel Cross. I'm a doctoral student here um, at the Fielding School. And I actually study structural racism and neighborhood health. And so um, I really appreciate your presentation. Oh, um, you. So my question for you um, is around how does the, the health department partner with other regulatory agencies in the county? Because from my understanding of LA County, a lot of the processes are very siloed. and yeah. so. The health department can have all of these great kind yeah. of uh, frameworks and things, but if, for example, the Department of Planning yep. is not on board, then land yep. uses are not going to change. So how yep. how do you all partner with other folks? Yeah, I mean, it's an excellent question, and uh, and I really think is sort of on right on the mark on sort of how narrow the purview is of a public health department in sort of determining how resources are going to be allocated. But I do think there's hope. One of the slides that I brushed over was a slide that showed uh, a report we issued on oil and gas. Um, and uh, those recommendations are now being used by both LA City Council uh, to do set-asides and setbacks. Um, so this was really an important issue about how far back from sensitive use should an oil well be able to uh, be active. Uh, and we are recommending at least 500 feet. Um, so that kind of information, you're right, we really depend on other folks uh, championing uh, the issue and then moving other elected officials or other regulatory bodies um, to actually adopt that. But unless somebody stands up and says, this is the right thing and this is why and this is the impact it has on health, um, and allows that information to be in the hands of folks in the community in ways that they can understand and use it, um, then I think we have less of an opportunity for the regulatory agencies and or the elected officials to be able to actually move in the right direction. I, I would totally say that um, the organizing part of this is most important um, and that information has to be made available to folks who can advocate for themselves and for their communities, because that's actually going to have more of an impact um, on getting things changed than expecting that bureaucratic departments, even like ours, are going to be able to move everybody else. But I do want to say, like uh, here in LA County, both the Office of Regional Planning, which is our planning department, and the Community Development Corporation have agreed with us that um, we should not be building 
sensitive use facilities uh, any closer than 500 feet from the highway. Now, sensitive use here is housing. You can imagine the big debate, given the housing crisis, on how, you know, where you should go to build housing as, you know, people, wonderful people are advocating build housing wherever you can. Um, our three departments are sort of saying, we understand those pressures. Uh, given there may be extenuating circumstances and elected officials may you know, decide to do differently, but our three departments don't think there's any justification for moving folks who are already uh, probably, uh, have, in, in, you know, probably experiencing some compromised health situations next to a freeway that will just exacerbate poor health and that we somehow have to figure out ways uh, of building the housing we need without further compromising the health and well-being of, of folks often who are vulnerable, especially if they're homeless people. Um, but it's a big issue and I appreciate your question. So. Please. I was surprised you didn't mention homelessness. Is homelessness a major uh, effort of your organization? Yeah, I mean, homelessness is the number one priority for all the county departments. Um, so, I, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't mention it, not because, I mean, not because I didn't, we don't care and we don't work really hard with all the other county departments, um, but just because I didn't have enough time to really talk about all the issues we worked on. And I really just wanted to highlight that um, for me, this, the issues around inequities force us as a public health department to focus on both individual stress and community stress. Um, and you know, I think homelessness is a manifestation in many ways of sort of this disintegration and disinvestment in some areas. I don't know, you know the other day um, there was a report issued that talked about the fact that 40% of the homeless people in LA County are black when blacks make up only 8% of LA County's population. So disproportionality uh, you know, again, it sort of rears its ugly head uh, whenever you start looking deep enough um, into uh, issues that we face. And this report actually called out uh, issues on structural racism. I mean, sort of the, 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 the set of recommendations was address issues around structural racism. If you want to get, if you want to really address homelessness, in LA County you have to address issues around structural racism. Um, and this was a, a, a report that, you know, had many, many people from different communities working on. Um, it wasn't a public health report, but it came to a similar conclusion. Be impossible to address these inequities if we don't really deal with issues around structural racism. So. Yes, please. Um, um, thank you for the good lecture. Um, Dr. Anna Quincy, Chairman of Global Care Medical Group. Um, I noticed in a lot of your presentation about neonatal mortalities, um, every t all the time the African Americans have higher mortality compared to the other groups. And the way that I put it together is it has to do with family stability. That's what, and when you compare the African from Africa and the African Americans here, the, the Africans from Africa, usually, they have stable families. And the African Americans, unfortunately, because of slavery, they are still lagging behind in family stability. A lot of the Caucasians or the Jewish groups, they, they have equity in education, husband and wife, and they can support each other. You can see an African American woman with PhD and law degree, she can't find a husband. She has nobody to support her. So she's even with all that education, with insurance, she's dealing with a lot of stress because she can't find a stable partner. That's how I explain the, all these things that you're talking about. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I think the, the role of, of support is critically important. Um, you know, I also think we would have to take a hard look at some of our other policies around sort of um, uh, family structures. Uh, I think you're right to note the legacy of slavery has been really destructive in this country. Um, but I also want to say, you know, the continued uh, sort of disproportionality 
uh, in arrests and convictions uh, has resulted in you know, one in three African American males uh, male adults in this county um, actually facing either an arrest and or a conviction and or time incarcerated. So, you know, I, and that's really, again, there's so much evidence around the disproportionality in every, at every single step there that I have to say, like, we have a systems issue as well about um, uh, how we uh, react and address um, issues around safety and, uh, and laws that unfortunately has continued to fracture disproportionately uh, people of color, particularly African Americans. You know, I had, um, I had, well, that, I'm, I'll stop there because <laughs> I know there are more questions. There's a lot of questions. But that was a great question. Okay, a few. So, and a great insight. Thank you. Uh, I'm a Fifi, I'm a professor. Yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> I, I want to thank you for clarifying and, and shining a, a laser light on uh, blaming the victim, is yeah. my way of saying it. Yeah. Um, but I can't help thinking that the rhetoric coming out of Washington and out of other places that have been encouraged to come out and not be disguised as they used to be. Yeah. in terms of the racism, yeah. um, I applaud your efforts to, to try to counteract those, yeah. those uh, tendencies that are happening today, but I can't help thinking, how can we shut them up? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big question. <laughs> Does anyone have the answer? <laughs> no, um, no I, th I think, you know, obviously, um, that's our struggle. Yeah. You know, uh, it's... Uh, been a long struggle in this country, I think, uh, and uh, you know this president has really, I think, unfortunately, given license um, to folks who, uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, are very entrenched in sort of the othering. You know, um, you're not like me. You're bad, um, uh, and. Not only are you bad, but I'm going to blame you for everything that's happening that's not going right in my life. Um, and I, I only want to say, from my perspective, that uh, I, I think um, what the, the good news is so many people uh, have come together to fight against the blatant racism. Uh, and the blatant discrimination and the blatant, I call violence against people that this president is perpetuating, that I, I am hopeful. Um, I see people working together who, may, who haven't historically worked together and finding common ground where they often haven't been able to take the time to find common ground. Um, because I, I think there's so much damage that is wrought by this administration and this president that it has forced us to understand how much we need each other. You know, and like, you know, we've often said, like, we don't always find agreement on everything, uh, but I think this president has made us understand that uh, for some of us, there's a set of values uh, that really guide how we uh, want to interact with each other and the people we work with, live with, pray with. Uh, that are being violated right now. And it's on those very values that we can actually find more common ground than we may have in the past. Um, so I am hopeful. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, we'll organize also. I mean, I, I, you know, I feel like as public health practitioners, we need to understand the power of organizing. And you know, it doesn't always mean a demonstration. It just means coming together, working across a variety of interests to find that common ground and really focus on addressing root causes, like not going so quickly to easy solutions for very complex problems. Um, I'm old enough to have remembered when we tried to, you know, sort of say we were going to solve the problem, you know, 30 years ago, we were going to solve the problem on black infant mortality rates being so much higher by lifting up all boats. We are going to just pour money in for everyone. And by doing that, you know, everyone was going to benefit, and 
everyone would, you know, enjoy better infant mortality rates. And there was some truth to that. Uh, infant mortality rates went down, but the gap just got wider um, because nobody wanted to really focus on disproportionality. Uh, nobody, because why? If you focus on disproportionality, you'd have to say, we need more resources going uh, to help black women. We need more resources going into systems and uh, organizations that are going to support black women and their families. We need to understand racism and its impact. I mean, the IOM produced a report, now I want to say 15 years ago, that identified uh, structural racism uh, across our healthcare providers and hospitals, uh, clinics, schools. Um, and, you know, that's still a shock when you talk to people and you say, like, yeah, no, people actually don't get treated the same. Um, you know, people actually think they still, they do. And they have a lot of explanations about why, you know, that data can't be possibly be right. Um, so, you know, we, we have a lot of work to do, but I think we're the right people to do it. I particularly think LA County is like the right place to try to do this work. There's a lot of wonderful leaders in the community that really sort of can help lead the way on this. We have time for just one or two more questions. I think one over there. Yep, please. Yes. Hi, thank you, Dr. Ferrer. Um, Michael Rodriguez, uh, Department of Family Medicine and Department of Community Health Sciences. Uh, and thank you for your uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, I guess I want to applaud you for the work that you're doing. Uh, I feel that part of what we need is enlightened leaders like you. Um, and to meet with enlightened leaders from other systems. I think it, it, there is a systems issue. Uh, you raised the issue of incarceration. And, and I feel humbly that, uh, that we need to work at it from the public health perspective, but we also need to have some cross-sector work with folks in other areas, right? In housing, in, you know, in, in criminal justice, so that we sort of align the work that we're doing. And, and, and I think work, as you said, with community. Uh, I was involved with a, a project export that was funded through the NIH project uh, of uh, uh, institutes, and um, we worked for about 15 years with uh, with many communities in in LA and uh, particularly South LA. And uh, I have to say, in honor of uh, one of the one of the community leaders, her name was uh, Loretta Jones, yeah. uh, and she is just a, a giant and and wonderful uh, person. And, uh, and, and, and a very visionary because of the issue of discrimination that you talk about is, uh, is not just one that's, uh, that's institutional, but it's also within communities. Absolutely. And, and uh, you know, it's not really talked about, but, you know, but there is also discrimination within communities. And, and, uh, and she was a wonderful person who was able to bring together the Latino community the African American community, the Asian community, to be working together uh, to address these issues that they face in common, and and uh, and so I hope that uh, I'm sure that the work that you're doing is building on some of that legacy and continuing work that's going on because it's so important. And I'm glad that you're here so that we can have a chance to work with you and support your vision, and and, and actualize and operationalize that framework that you have. Uh, for infant mortality, for environmental justice, and for the many homelessness and the many other issues, uh, because it really is uh, inspirational uh, so that we can go forward and, and actually make LA uh, a place, uh, a more healthy place, and share our experiences with other places. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, I want to be clear, like, this isn't, you know, this isn't, uh, I, I'm not, first of all, I'm here only because so many people have taken the time and had patience with me and helped me on my own learning journey. Um, I have like made so many mistakes and so many missteps uh, and so many people were patient and sort of said, uh, let's keep talking to her. <laughs> let's see if this lady will learn what she needs to learn or understand what she needs to understand. And um, so, you know, I, I'm only here because so many people have really helped me grow uh, and helped me understand and helped me learn 
um, about how to be of service. Um, and uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm privileged and honored that I'm here, um, but I'm really a reflection of, you know, hundreds of people who have dedicated their entire lives to this work and have been willing partners and teachers along the way to, to people like me. So you know, I want to give a lot of credit to, to a lot of other people uh, for this. I also want to acknowledge that I work with a wonderful team, not just at the Department of Public Health. You know, Dr. Davis is, is here, and enormous wealth of knowledge. He comes and led this work up in Oakland uh, in Alameda County. Uh, but also, you know, uh, even in our county family, I mean, all, every single employee in the county had to uh, participate in training on implicit bias. So it's sort of like, let's do some personal growth work here, and let's have everybody understand sort of one of the roots of disrespect. Um, and uh, so, you know, so I, again, I'm honored. I am part of a larger county family, and I'm obviously led by an amazing board of supervisors who also talks about issues around racism and the impact of racism and, and allows us to focus our work in that way because it wouldn't be possible without that kind of support as well. So we have time for one more question. Okay. Uh, hello, I'm Ritu Sedana and I'm a double Bruin, but I currently work at the World Health Organization in Geneva and I was part of the Commission on Social Determinants of Health. And I must say that what you've described is the real work in terms of really not just uh, describing the problems and particularly not blaming the individuals, but really understanding the root cause, causes, what are the social processes that lead to uh, stratification, and then what sorts of systems and built environments can make a difference. Uh, my question is, to what extent you mentioned that you wanted to go beyond just the metrics, um, but really understand what can be done. And that's something that we're really searching for because we have a lot of problem description, yeah. but we're interested in the what and the how yeah. and ensuring that people monitor the before and the after. Yeah. So we're very keen to be able to share experiences. California is the fifth largest economy in the world. And as we've been discussing um, over the past few days, uh, with the UCLA Center for Health Policy Research, 4% of the world is Americans, but they spend 43% of all the health expenditures. Yeah. So there's a big masking yeah. of disproportion in the yeah. way that money is spent. Yeah, I, I thank you, and thank you for all the work you are doing with, with uh, WHO. It's just, uh, it's, an, it's an amazing opportunity, I think, uh, at, to really think about this world. It's, this work is being global, which it is. Um, so I think, you know, I think there are two places where, you know, as, as a sort of government agency, you can, you know, work quickly. Um, you know, first is I call it like an all-in policy. Um, so like, you, you have to look at all the different sort of books of business you have. So one thing is we contract out every year, I want to say like, God, probably like $600 million are going back out. Um, so if we looked at our contracting policies and we said, you know, what's an equity lens on contracting? Go local, increase the number of minority-owned businesses, women-owned businesses, GLBTQ-owned businesses, you know, like sort of, you know, what could you do if you just looked at your contracting differently and just actually put those dollars uh, back into the very communities who we've disinvested in historically? Um, so you know, that would have an impact, a huge impact. Um, and then, you know, you sort of, I mean, I just sort of walked down the line, like what are our HR policies like? You know, how do they afford opportunities for us to uh, bring in the talent um, that, um, that's there? Um, and, you know, what, what does sort of a local hire look like? Or, and then, you know, to back that up. You know, what are our investments in uh, those organizations that are training folks who will then be able to work with us? And how do we support, you know, I was formerly a high school principal of a district high school in Boston. So you know, I feel passionately that you, know, you, you, need to, you need to offer young people opportunities and support. They're 
really, across the board, they're pretty brilliant. And the only reason they're not in our workforce is they didn't have the opportunities and resources that uh, others of us have that made it possible for them to come and do what they dream of doing, because everybody has dreams. Um, so, you know, how do you start supporting programs? I'm working right now with, with Dr. Carlisle and CDU to create a, a program at CDU uh, that's for high school students. Um, that really allows high school students to get support through a summer academic enrichment program and then internships during the year with community organizations that are fighting for justice. So that they build their leadership skills around fighting for justice, but then they get support. So what their dreams can become a reality because there's a bunch of folks that believe in them and that are going to help make sure they have opportunities and resources needed. Um, so I, I think there's a whole book of business there that we forget that we can influence because we're just a large county. Uh, you know, the county has 107,000 107, employees. You know, the budget for the county is like $45 billion. So, you know, if you just think about, you know, how, how could you use that money sort of with an equity lens, you can understand there's going to be a big impact there. And then I, I think the second part, though, is you know, how do we actually engage in more policy work and systems change work? You know, we're always going to be about doing services, but even if you're doing services, you could use, you could do services in a way that's empowering. It doesn't have to always be that, you know, we're in charge, you're not. We're the, we're the people with all the information, you're the people without, because you come and see us. You know, we're the doctors, the nurses. You know, how do you in fact create sort of a different dynamic even in your service delivery? And then offer people opportunities for them to lift up their voices. I mean, I, you know, one of the things we're working on at the health department is we don't really have like a consumer advisory board of, made up of people who use our services. Uh, we barely have satisfaction surveys that are going out to everyone. And we have a long way to go to sort of how do we actually lift up the voices and have the people who we're in service of tell us what kinds of services they need, they want, and how we ought to be delivering those. So even as part of being a service organization, we could do things differently. So I think there's two tracks you can take as a large organization. I don't have an easy answer, like I'll do A, B, C, and D, but I do think if you look at you know, your work in both those areas, you might have some insights that would help figure out you know, what's a path forward for your own organization. Thank you for a okay, thank wonderful you. Thank you all. You've been a great audience. Thanks a million. I, I'd like to um, present you oh. with the uh, 2019 Lester Breslow oh, Distinguished so nice. Lecturer Award. And thank, thank you, you for your visionary thank leadership. You. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you so much. This is thank so nice. Thank Thanks for inviting me. It's been a terrific and wonderful evening. Uh, I want to thank Devra for carrying on the tradition and the legacy. And it's wonderful to have you here. It's wonderful to have all of you here. Uh, and we hope to see you at an upcoming event. And if you look at the back of your program, you'll see a lot of events scheduled. So we hope to see you there. Following this, we have a dessert reception outside. So if you haven't seen the, the Lester Breslow archive, take another look and enjoy and socialize. Thank you again for coming, and have a wonderful evening. <laughs>